This program is powered by the Virtual Show, making your offline events virtual. Ladies and gentlemen, the host of Webit Virtual, Dr. Plamen Rusev. What a fantastic opportunity to meet again with the wonderful Webit community from all around the world. Thank you for joining the Brand Innovation Week at uh, Webit Virtual continues today with one of my favorite formats meeting you with through forward thinkers and um, opinion leaders from global media around the world, or in other words, the leading media forum here at Webit Virtual. We are discussing about brands and about the current crisis, which is almost everything you can think of. It is economic, it, it is, um, it is um, um, humanitarian, it is obviously also a health crisis. So uh, how do we deal in times of crisis, brands in, crisis, in times of crisis, brands in, um, in quarantine, all this in the next one hour of fantastic discussions with great panelists. And without further ado, I would like to immediately introduce them one after another. This is my first guest. Anastasia Karpova is a media manager and business journalist, deputy editor-in-chief and head of Under 30 at Forbes Russia. Before that, she worked at Interfax News Agency and RBC. Anastasia started her career as a junior reporter and has been working as a business journalist, editor and multimedia manager and has eight years of experience in Russian leading news and business media. Anastasia, welcome to Webit Virtual. Thank you for joining. Hi, thank you. Many people tell me that um, they kind of envy me for uh, talking to almost all great people from all around the world. But I envy you for having access to all these amazingly talented young people, in your case from, uh, from Russia, being responsible for the Forbes 30 Under 30 and uh, of course being tapped so much into innovation so um if you have ever ended me for anything stop no need <laughs> uh thank you so much allow me to introduce all other uh, participants the three more panelists we have today and we jump in deep dive discussions about um, about brands and innovation this is my second panelist John Cotier is a host of the AI show Adventure Beat and columnist at Forbes. He is a journalist, analyst and tech executive. He writes for Forbes and consults with Silicon Valley companies. John built the Insight Research Division at Venture Beat, managed teams creating software for partners like Intel and Disney and secured VC funding for his AR cloud startup Genesis Reality. John, John, such a pleasure, pleasure to have you with, with us. us. Thank, thank you so much for joining, finally. I know, it's wonderful. Thank you. I'm a big fan of what you're doing, and uh, I've been following a couple of uh, uh, your online shows, uh, which are developing and uh, getting better and better. Thank you so much for, for getting us uh, uh, closer to, to what you think and uh, where you see the world is getting into with the AI. I wonder, what do you think? I mean, look at this. A, a, a very normal biovirus has uh, hacked us and look what happened. Uh, what if that was a combination of a bio and AI virus? What would have, uh, what would have been uh, the chances for us? I don't know. I guess it'd be the gray goo problem, right? Nanotechnology. Uh, we, <laughs> we'd be in even tougher than we are right now. Oh my gosh! Yeah, I, we are having we were having uh, the father of internet uh, been served twice in our virtual studios for the past few months, and um, it's always amazing to to talk to someone who's the reason for all of us to to be connected now, and at wow. least to share uh, our thoughts and ideas, and you know, connect the beauty of the minds of so many people. It's always funny when I ask him, "Hey, uh, doctor, sir." Think about it. What would have what would have been the, the human answer to this pandemic if there was no internet? Um, he's always very modest and very shy. He he said, um, 
yeah, that would have been terrible. <laughs> so we um, wouldn't even have known about it. It would be like the influenza uh, of 1918 or something like that, where it just kind of happened and 50 million uh, people died and nobody really knew. Indeed, uh, that's how how uh, unthinkable is our life and the contemporary lifestyle of of all of us, the humankind. And, um, and we barely realize um, what we have in, in our hands, but what is coming up next is, uh, is kind of, uh, wow. So uh, let's go there. Uh, I would love to talk to all of you. Let me introduce, allow me to introduce the third and the fourth panelists, and let's jump deep into, into our discussion. This is my third panelist. Roger Dooley is a columnist at Forbes and an author and international keynote speaker. His articles give readers practical ways to turn the latest brain and behavior research into simple, real-world strategies for improving marketing, sales and advertising. Some articles focus on big brands that are succeeding or failing at appealing to their customers' emotions and non-conscious decision processes. Roger, such a great pleasure to welcome you to Webit Virtual. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted to have you with us. Thank you. Well, thank you for inviting me, Plop, and happy to be here. Uh, I am uh, always uh, uh, happy to be surrounded by fellow entrepreneurs uh, who try to use their voice and, uh, of course, energy to change the world, to make it a better place. You have built quite a number of different channels to to impact, and uh, definitely for us, it's uh, it's a true pleasure to welcome you at uh, Webit Virtual. Allow me to introduce uh, uh, a dear friend joining us as our fourth panelist, and uh, we are all set to to go. And this is my fourth panelist. Red Power is a weekly columnist for Forbes and Inc. magazine. He is CEO of Power Coaching and Consulting and hosts Power Punch Live, one of the most popular business talk shows on LinkedIn's new live platform. Red was recently named the 2018 Best Small Business Coach in the US. Red, welcome back. Thank you for joining. Wow, it is awesome to be here. No doubt about that. Thank you for having me. You know what? I think we should we should do some um, some bet or whatever. You know, um, when everything finishes, we remove our beers. Okay, I I cut mine last <laughs> night just for this. <laughs> you know what? It's yeah. I mean, I I cut my hair. Uh, we should do some other crazy stuff. You know, this this thing goes nowhere. We 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 have zero visibility, and so we've been talking with you for months. And this uncertainty um, has not uh, has not changed at all. We're still there, and so, you know, I mean, you know, we know some new stuff, but not much, isn't it? You know, you know, I I, I have to tell you, you know, I I, I owe my fourteen year old son fifty dollars now because I cut this just for you, so uh, so I could <laughs> you know be presentable today, so. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll have to we'll have to come up. With oh a my good, gosh! Uh, I, I've got you know how to put people in the on dependence. <laughs> 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 Thank you so much for joining, Red. Uh, allow me to have you all in the studio, and let's start this discussion. We promised so many things to our wonderful community from all around the world, and we hate to overpromise. So we have to answer a bunch of questions. I mean, you have to answer a bunch of questions which I will kindly ask you. I, I like this change of roles when you guys have to answer instead of asking questions. And my question for all of you, and knowing you how, how gentle men you are all, most probably Anastasia will have to answer it first. Um, so can you give an advice um, on the today's modern market here in, in building brand and some key um, you know, approaches for the success in this challenging COVID times. Anastasia, let's start with you. You're working with all these young people of Moscow and Russia. You know all these new young entrepreneurs. What would be your advice for their marketing approach? Uh, I would say that my first advice will be to simplify their messages in, in these hard times because uh, um, I think that all the users and all the customers 
they just want to hear something direct and simple from the brands they love. Uh, and uh, my advice uh, will be just to, to talk in a simple way to your customers. I think that that will be my uh, first advice. Thank you so much. Uh, John, what do you say? I think there's two real temptations right now for brands. And one is to totally be silent. And the other is to not stop talking. <laughs> and I think both extremes need to be really avoided. Honestly, it's really challenging right now. I'm in Canada, so I'm just north of the United States. So much turmoil going on there. We're not just talking the pandemic. We're not just talking coronavirus. We're talking conspiracy theories around that. We're talking political things going on, an election coming up, Black Lives Matter and other things happening and a lot of challenge and strife and turmoil. And in that situation, it's very easy for brands to say, whoa, I just need to back away from this a little bit and and not, you know, dive into this, this, this this stew, this, this turmoil, you can't do that as a brand because you become irrelevant. You do have to take a stand. Even if you're like the national football league dragged in kicking and stream screaming because your players demand that you take a stand, right? So you do have to say something. I love what Nastia said, which was simplify because it's a very busy, noisy environment out there. A lot of news happening a lot of scary things happening economically, politically, all those things. So you do have to say something, but you don't need to dominate the conversation. And it's it's also really really challenging if you you have this newfound vigor, or 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 you found religion all of a sudden in in COVID nineteen and you never stop talking. Look, we have to listen to the right voices in really really tough times. And yeah, a brand has a chance to say something, but it still needs to be authentic to your brand. Absolutely, yeah. Authenticity is kind of kind of the key element because um, even in these weird times when we cannot meet each other, we cannot hug each other, when the energy can flow and then and then the marketeers can send them more human messages, uh, events are all stuck in, in the nowhere except for the virtual, obviously, where people interact, uh, where, the, you know, the launches are happening and people can, can experience things. Now we only have authenticity, isn't it? I mean, what we have built so far um, is kind of the best basis to move ahead. And, and Roger, uh, your book, you put a very special um, place for and spent quite a lot of pages writing about Amazon. Um, <clears throat> why is Amazon so prominent in your book? Not that we don't know that Amazon is kind of the biggest winner of this crisis because yes there are winners we all know like microsoft amazon apple um so what is what is the what is the thing for you there right well plumbing my friction book came out before the pandemic so uh, amazon's success in the pandemic uh, um, perhaps could be anticipated but uh, uh, you know i think actually amazon is a great example because in the run up to the pandemic uh, they created a very effortless customer experience and this has served them very well. And what we've seen with the pandemic is those companies that had a very solid digital customer experience with so much shifting to digital from in-person, those companies have prospered. Uh, I've seen it locally with, uh, for example, uh, supermarket chains where some were more digitally advanced than others. And the ones that were not digitally advanced really struggled. But I think there's also a lesson here from Amazon and that is that you can't just focus on customer experience. You have to focus on employee experience because Amazon has been one of the most trusted brands for years. People love Amazon. They're so reliable, so dependable, so effortless. They're great. But what we've seen is uh, a few uh, cracks developing because of uh, employee issues where uh, employees didn't always feel that they were being um, kept in a safe, uh, treated in a safe way. Uh, that the demands were being placed on them to maintain uh, 
Amazon's deliveries and such were perhaps uh, too great or didn't reflect a concern for them and their health. Mm. So, and that could tarnish Amazon's overall customer experience. You can't just focus on customer experience. You have to focus on employee experience as well. Thank you so much, Roger. Indeed, um, I, can't, I can't say um, how important is it is at the end of the day to realize that it's not only the customers, it's not only your brand, it's actually the 360, and that includes uh, in a big time your own employees, especially when you have that many, but even with ours, I mean, uh, we were discussing many times this, that for us it was very, very important to, to make sure that they all feel safe and secure, that there'll be no layoffs, that there'll be security environment built. Actually, we, we did kind of in, a, in advance, I think since February um, at Webit, we, we decided we go home office and uh, everyone stays there. So uh, I'm not sure um, if, um, what is it, six months already, if, uh, if this is going to last forever or how is it going to be, but um, it is what it is. And uh, Red for, for uh, many times we've been discussing the topics around COVID and uh, we were, um, I kind of know your opinion on, on a bunch of themes already, uh, but I would like to, to hear um, your thoughts on how do you achieve and sustain this authenticity that we are discussing in this changing environment and, and changing industries. I mean, everything is changing. So um, how important do you think is, is this for the brand? I think it's, it's critical. Go, going back to what uh, John sort of talked about a little bit, and, and I think brands need to worry less about positioning to match the audience, but more about matching purpose to actions. And I think if you get that part of it right, um, because let's, let's just be honest, you, you can't, be in neutral anymore. You have to, I mean, I think society is in a lot of ways because we are in a one touch world and I can look at uh, where a company stands. I can look at where um, a company has come down on these issues and I make my decisions as a, as a, as a consumer based on that. Uh, I think now you, you have to be on the right side of the issues, the right side of where society is and where it's moving. And I think that uh, that's just, the way it is now and 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 so i think brands that that understand that and they and they match their purpose uh, to their actions i think are going to be successful definitely in regards to authenticity um my question for anastasia is um, um so you 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 already started simplicity is the message so where do you see is i mean message is good but come on we are going beyond the messages for many years already so the mantra of the message turned into a conversation and and uh, now we are more into into experiences so where do you see that uh, the future of experiences is anastasia is it all virtual how is it going to be uh yeah i think that now we have nothing to do but to to deal with virtual experiences but um I see that some brands, they just stopped everything. Uh, they used to have events, uh, I mean, offline events, but since the pandemic started, they, they just stopped everything. And I think that's not right. So I think they, they should just reschedule all the events into the online. Otherwise, people just forget about them. And that, that is very important. So what, what I see here in Russia, that some really great brands just stopped everything because they, they want to communicate with their audience and users offline. Uh, and starting from February, they just stop all the events. And I think that that is not the right way for, 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 for brands because people will just forget about you. Um, and my advice is to even to try to have something online. We have a lot of platforms now, starting from Zoom and we have Skype and everything, and you can just try and something online, which is very important for, because <laughs> you, you, you need your, uh, your community to be, uh, to be online and to be with you even, even during the pandemic. 
No, I can't agree more than that with you, Anastasia. Um, we, I'm, I'm having like constant, you know, that Webit was, I think, if not the first, uh, among the first uh, global events that virtualized, actually, I think we were the first, it was crazy. It was in uh, on 4th of April, I think was our first virtual event. So um, yeah, it's been a roller coaster. Uh, that's where we transferred all our team from uh, in-person uh, event managers, producers, and whatever you can think of, uh, a huge team of, of great people into completely different roles, uh, becoming digital, being with us now, doing all this virtually. And uh, on the top, of course, using the, the platform, the virtual show, uh, currently it, the platform is fully booked up until November. So um, more and more brands realize it and more and more CMOs keep on calling me because they know I'm, I mean, I'm on, on the screen like almost every day. We used to have one event per year. Now we have three, uh, per, three to four per week. So definitely that type of immersive experience is fantastic. And that also gives us that type of live contact with, uh, uh, with everyone. But still talking about experiences, uh, John, where do you see it going? For God's sake. Actually, you are the first writing about Webit Virtual. I should say a huge thank you for sharing on Forbes and also sharing about the virtual.show platform. But where do you see these experiences are heading? That's, uh, I, I think, critical for all marketeers to understand it and to start implementing. I think it's super interesting. Um, just to tag back on what Nastia said as well, you know, what you see some brands doing is is kind of, it's easy if there's a virtual event to, okay, I'll ping in, I'll ping out, whatever. Um, you know, it doesn't ring or ding like the phone or email or Slack or something like that. But what they'll do is they'll set up a special time and then they'll also give you a coupon for Uber Eats or something like that or skip the dishes or something like that. So that, you know what, we're having a virtual lunch. <laughs> it's a luncheon. We're all in our own places, but everybody is actually ordering in. It's kind of special. It makes it, a, it, makes it an event. It makes it something unique and different. And so then it, 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 it ties it all back together. I think it, you were one of the first. I mean, that was amazing. I was planning to go out. That was the first time I was going to be at your event. And you were one of the first, if not the first, to have a major virtual event. It's really critical that those be multimedia, that there's back channel, that there's other things going on. I mean, you know what? When you're a virtual event, you have to be top notch because you're competing against the best, the curated best of YouTube and Twitter and yeah. Reddit and, and everybody's work, <laughs> which still has to happen, right? So it's really, really challenging. And kids at like, home driving everyone crazy. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. That's all good. But I mean, so I think, I think a great way in which um, you've done it and I think others need to do as well is to have individual components in the event that people can ping in, ping out of. They still have their things that they need to get to and get done. But you know what? If you can have that, you can ping in. It's on demand later on. It's wonderful. And then, I mean, uh, maybe I'm still in your thunder. I'm not sure. You showed us a little bit of your upcoming platform and it's multimodal, right? There's chat, there's individual uh, conversations happening on, there's back channel conversations, other things like that. I think that's more of a kind of a conference experience. You know, um, everybody here has gone to a lot of conferences and not in the last four months, five months. One of the best things about a conference is not what's happening in the room. <laughs> sometimes, you know, sometimes we're on stage, we think, hey, you got to be less. Absolutely. There's great things that happen on stage, but some of the best things are in between the stages, backstage, you know, in the hallways. And the more that you can recreate something like that, something real, something authentic, something kind of serendipitous, right? Um, the better. Yeah, definitely. I'm, um, but honestly, John, I would love to walk you through. Um, further into the virtual experience of the events that uh, we're planning. Uh, we have these things called guided serendipity. We're meeting you virtually. I really do think that, I mean, now once I have the full picture of where the virtual experiences are heading, and we added uh, AI in there, we implemented special algorithms of matching and making people really, really meet the right, uh, the right people on the other side both not only in personal, not only in professional, but personal profiling. Uh, I'm thinking that that's it. I mean, there's no way back because, um, I mean, as event organizers, 
we always want to make the most for, I mean, we had like 120 <laughs> countries in these coming from 120 countries. And you never want to, to, to feel that, I mean, they to feel that they wasted their time. So you always want the best. Now, having this technology in my hands, I said, oh my gosh, I mean, that's it. You can match the right people. You can, well, of course, the human factor is missing. But <clears throat> um, So you're saying you have Tinder for conferences? Tinder for virtual conferences? <laughs> Swipe right on the... <laughs> Why? How do you know that? Why I haven't not? showed you that. Why How not? do you know that? Oh, gosh. Why not? Yes. Yes. That's there is have, futurist but... somewhere in my tagline. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, that's how we were calling it at the very beginning. This uh, guided serendipity is exactly that Tinder for business. That That's exactly with the swiping. I will show you. How, but it's fantastic. I love it. So, um, yeah. But when we talk about experiences, do you think that AI will take over this experience and I would like to have all of you joining this discussion now because I think that's key. Um, uh, everything moves so fast. I'm, I'm following, uh, um, yesterday we were having some great startups pitching and, um, and they, some of them were pretty much doing what we are discussing now, truly immersive AI experiences uh, online. So if that's the case, how many brands do you think can adapt to these fast changes that are happening now. Can you give us any ideas and any good examples? I mean, really, that's a question for all of you. Just jump in the in the talk. I shouldn't say all of you. All at once. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, let's let's start with Trent. Well, I uh, first off, going back to your last question, I have to I have to jump in on that last question, and I'll, I'll uh, I do have an answer to your other one. I just went to a virtual conference and what was really awesome about it were two things. One is about three days before the conference, I got my bag of swag, you know, and they, they sent me a box and I was able to open my box and I had all the stuff I'd come home with anyway. Right. And, and that was a lot of fun. And it was also informative uh, because I got things from the sponsors and I got things from companies that I wanted to hear from. And so it, it was it was really interesting to be able to open a box with this online conference that I was supposed to go to. And then they also had meeting rooms. Uh, one of the other things I love about conferences is those random meetings uh, with people that I did not expect to meet. Right. I, I usually go to a conference with a list of people I want to meet, but it's those random conversations that uh, are just what makes some some of these interactions really amazing. Uh, so they had Zoom rooms open at certain times of the day during breaks that you could come into and just have small chats and meet other people sort of live. And I thought that was a, a great way to meet random people. And I actually have a conversation this afternoon with someone I met at that conference uh, to talk about uh, working together on something. So I, I think that that was, that was really fan fantastic. And in terms of your question, I, I think the answer to that is, is what do we expect from the brands of the future? And I think it is going to be, uh, you know, where familiarity and predictability used to be the hallmark of and what you expected and wanted from a brand. I think what we're going to expect in the future is disruption and innovation and change, pushing us uh, to another place, uh, whether that's in an, in an experience or a product. And I mean, I think there are a lot of companies that are doing that well. You, you talked about Amazon. Uh, I think they do that really well. Uh, I mean, you think about Starbucks. I mean, they're always pushing new product. They're always pushing new uh, store concepts. Uh, so there are brands that are that, that are sort of old and, 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 and known brands that are doing this really well. Um, but what's interesting is what, what are those companies that you don't know? What are they going to do? And I think that's what I'm really excited about. Rhett, that's super interesting to hear because you know what I see is I see a lot of brands are terrified. Um, they are scared. And it's quite amazing because if you go on YouTube and you go on TikTok and other places like that, you see yeah. that a kid with a smartphone can reach an audience of tens of millions and a brand right. that might be a billion dollar brand with offices all over the people, thousands of people, uh, all, all over the place, thousands of people, you know, can, has to have a meeting and lots of people and cons consensus and then get all right. official about it. When you know what? 
people are behind brands. People are the brands. Expose your people to the brands. That sounds bad. You don't know. You know what I mean? <laughs> but <laughs> but <laughs> um, a brand is human or it's not a good brand. And so right. you know what? You need you don't need to be scripted. You don't need the full on amazing setting that Plamen has here for this virtual conference with the green screen and everything like that. You can just have a smartphone in your hand. Don't share secrets. Be real and authentic <laughs> and reach out to your customers, to your to the people that you talk to that 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 might value what you do and just have start conversations. And guess what? When you can start that way, start really simply, start really, you know, baseline level, you will grow so quickly. The real problem is when you are not engaging, the rate at which you learn is, is you're flatlining. You need yeah. to be growing and learning. So, I mean, you'd probably do this. I certainly do this. Plamen is doing this. I'm sure everybody on the call is doing this. I'm spending way more time doing live streams right now. And then I'm using that material, a lot of things in my podcast, other things like that. And you know what? I sucked. <laughs> I started and I sucked. And you have to have the willingness to suck if you uh, want to grow. Ultimately, that's the that's the scenario. You know what? You, you you're going to start, and you may not. You may, maybe maybe you're one of the special ones, and you don't suck right away. And maybe you're pretty good right away. But the thing is, learning curve. And a brand has a learning curve. A company has a learning curve, just like people have a learning curve. Get in there, get started, try, be willing to fail. Uh, make sure those failures aren't catastrophic. Right? You need to have some parameters, some guidelines around that. But start learning how to engage virtually with people on a real human basis. Yeah, nope. embracing. Yeah. yeah one uh, this is a question to, to Roger. Roger, please, could you please share your take on that? And, and um, uh, your book is, is a kind of a guide, even though you mentioned it, it was before the crisis, but now we see many of the things uh, that uh, uh, we've been talking actually uh, need to be implemented as AAP. And, um, um, John has been mentioning something. I take it from there. What, what about the, the the Japanese concept of kaizen, the the continuous improvement and muda waste? Uh, how they how they relate to this? This is the internal friction, and and I would like to talk to with you more about the, the friction in in, uh, in in general and about your definition there. Right. Well, the simplest definition of friction is. Uh, any unnecessary effort to complete a task. And uh, that plays out in many ways. It plays out in customer experience, whether you can place an order with one click or it takes four screens to place that order and so on. Uh, but uh, it takes place in employee experience. Are there um, bad procedures, processes that waste their time and they know their time is being wasted? But, you know, I think the pandemic's been interesting because it has been a great friction creator. Things that used to be really easy suddenly became very difficult to do and took a lot more effort. Good grief, just shopping, grocery shopping uh, that you didn't give any thought to before suddenly became an event that you had to plan for and so on. Uh, so it added friction. But also, I think that what we've seen is uh, there has been friction eliminated in certain areas where we couldn't do things, but now suddenly because of the pandemic, uh, we've discovered that, oh, we can. I think one example in the U.S. is that telemedicine, the ability to visit a doctor uh, with a phone or video device or something uh, was not very common. And typically there were problems with insurance. There were problems with the doctors getting properly paid for those kinds of visits and so on. And uh, so it didn't happen, even though in many cases, uh, that would be far more convenient for both the doctor and the patient, in, in particular for the patient. Uh, at least the doctor usually gets to stay in one place, but uh, the patient has to travel to the office only to be perhaps given some uh, information and instructions with, uh, about an actual exam taking place. And suddenly, with the pandemic, telemedicine became possible. Uh, and you know, I'm hoping that some, some of the friction reduction that we've seen here sticks afterwards because many uh, small rules and regulations have been kind of swept aside to enable people to go about their daily lives as efficiently as possible. And I think in some cases, the same special interests that 
uh, caused those to be in place before, we'll try and reinstate them. But I'm hoping that uh, despite all of the extra effort that this pandemic has caused, that maybe going forward, uh, we will have see areas that things have been accelerated. I think working from home is perhaps the biggest example. But you know, there were so many companies, no, we can't do that. We don't know what our people are doing. We can't, it won't work in our industry. <laughs> Suddenly, uh, people have no choice and they discover, hey, this is working. It's working well. The people like it by and large. Uh, and people are getting stuff done, getting more done in some cases. And you know, are we really going to go back to the way it was? Uh, in many cases, I think not. And that's what businesses really have to plan for now. What's it going to look like when we have the ability to do more things in person again? Uh, you know, how will things change? Uh, because it won't be exactly the way it was before. Yes, it will not be the same what it was before. We know, I think that Google announced that by July 2021, they are not expecting their, their employees mm -hmm. back to the offices. And uh, Siemens just announced uh, last week, um, work from home indefinitely. It's not going to be the same. We know that very well. The question is how brands adapt. That's the, the whole theme of this week. And uh, we're going to be challenging that because at the end of the day, uh, we all know that above all, Google is, is an advertising platform that makes billions out of this. And of course, that's connected. Uh, you can say the same for, for Facebook and others. So it's where the real money go. Um, and then they're invested in technology and AI and the, add -on, the, the other layers on the top of these technology giants. So, um, Anastasia, back to you. Um, let's, let's talk about the importance of brand purpose, uh, promise, mission. Um, how to deliver value to your company in these times? How do you state those and how do you stand by them and by your own community? What is your take on that? I think it's very important to create your own community around your brand because uh, your loyal users and your loyal uh, customers uh, will advertise your brand and your product. Uh, and so you, your brand promises your commitment. Uh, and you as a brand, you should communicate with your, with your loyal uh, users and, and customers. Because it's very important, uh, and I totally agree with what John mentioned at the beginning, that during these pandemic times, you shouldn't stay silent. Uh, and what is very important as well is to uh, to give the uh, to communicate in a fast way with your community. So you need to react on the on the things happening around you. That's very important, and. So now we, we have everything online. We have a lot of conferences. What I, do I like about this time that I can attend every single conference on the world, in the world, just, I just open my laptop and I'm there. And so for brands, it's a really great opportunity. So you can just participate in everything, in every single conference and every single event, and you can uh, communicate with users and, uh, all around the world, which is amazing. That's how brands should create the communities around them. You know what's really interesting about that? What I've seen a couple of good examples of is uh, Slack channels, where a company, and this doesn't work for everybody, maybe if you're in retail or something like that, or consumer packaged goods or something like that, it's probably not the same, but maybe, who knows? But I've seen, especially in the SaaS business, software as a service, where companies have established a Slack channel. And it's not necessarily customer only or prospect only. It's for people in this space, in the industry, to have conversations about what's happening and what's going on. And I've seen multiple companies build thousand plus person Slack channels very, very quickly, which are just incredible because you get immediate access 
to thought leadership, to what people are thinking, uh, sort of unfiltered. Um, and actually, really, really interestingly, I've seen it in multiple cases where people, there, there's people who are, are customers of competitors will join a Slack channel for, for a company. And all of a sudden, boom, that's somebody that you can influence, that's somebody you can talk to, that's somebody you can private message on Slack when there's something that's super interesting. You have to deal with that in the right way. All the, all the same rules apply around you know, being a good custodian or curator of a community. Uh, but it, it's really interesting if you think about what Roger was talking about in terms of friction. When something becomes high friction, that, that trip to the grocery store, that trip to the mall, other things that were previously higher friction, maybe for some e-commerce, maybe for some ordering food or groceries online or something like that become lower friction by contrast. And those are areas where brands can jump in and say, hey, this was impractical at one point because people had an easier way of doing it or a more immediate way of doing it. Now they can't do that or they don't want to do that. Now that is that what 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 was once higher friction is now lower friction. Let's jump in there. You know, to underscore the point about community, uh, I think it's so critical. People are hungry for community these days. First, during the lockdown periods, uh, people were desperate for other human contact. And uh, even going forward, when we've got perhaps a much larger portion of the workforce working from home or otherwise doing things from home that previously they would have interacted wow. and to talk about the topic. But there was also a big interest in interacting with each other. And we had to set up a special area uh, where people could just chat about uh, the movie they saw or you know what they were having for dinner, uh, even though it was totally off topic for the community. And uh, this was one of the busiest areas in that community uh, after a period of time. And to me, the, the interesting thing in the future is so many communities these days are still text-based. You know, they're message boards, they are uh, Slack channels and whatnot. I think when we, uh, as we go forward, we will see, see much more of a multimedia community <laughs> development but uh, uh that that remains to be seen right now well and the brands that and the brands that actually create that community or help facilitate the, the the growth of that community really well are just going to do really really super well in the market i mean you know if you if you understand that we're tribal in some ways right and we want to be with people that we identify with um and i think that people that understand that that the you know, we're getting better at understanding why uh, the buying habits of people. We're getting better at understanding what what uh, what people are looking for in in, in a brand. Uh, we're understanding the science behind that better now, and I think companies that that utilize that um, that information and 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 facilitate their community uh, are going to do just I mean, extraordinary in the market. So the really key word Go ahead. is community, um, and Obviously, you cannot build community without authenticity. Uh, and I would say communities are built around shared necessities. So identifying the necessities, building communities around them, and more like not leading, but stewardship. It's like not leadership, but stewardship in these digital times most probably will add more value. If I've heard you well, uh, what, what you are sharing because we are kind of pressed by, by the time, and of course you can disagree with this kind of wrap up 30 minutes before the end. I would like you all to, to reflect on a number of questions which um, go in, in the following way. First, what is the future of branding? Brett, let's start with you now. Wow, no pressure, future. Brett, no pressure at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, come just on. answer it all. The future of branding right now. <laughs> I'm going to nail it. I'm, yeah, thank you. All right. uh, no, I, I think um, the, the key for me is that um, uh, branding is going to become more personal, right? Um, I think brands, uh, as we have big data and we have AI and we have the ability to, to understand that and, 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 personalize our, our, our message to people. Um, I think that's going to change uh, the, the, the buying experience um, because it's based on individual needs and behaviors and preferences and, and companies that, that, that really become and personalize the, their, their message to people and the products to people 
um, is is going to are brands that are going to really really do well. And I think we're going to see a lot more of that as we go forward. Um, I think we're going to see um, these these sort of co-authored experiences, right? Um, or co-promotions, as what we used to call it when I was in the radio business. Um, you know, you look at uh, like Lyft and ADT's partnership, and you look at MasterCard working with Apple Pay, and and all of these sort of different uh, brands coming together to sort of co-brand a product or, or or create these experiences for customers. I think we're going to see a whole lot more of that. Um, so, but I, I think overall, the the brands that um, that know when it's time to evolve and, and where their audience are headed, I think those are the brands that are going to be successful. Well, that's, um, that's a very short answer to a very complex question. Thank you so much for that. Let's make it even more interesting for John, who will jump in here, um, uh, bragging me about. John, I mean, there was the time when we were saying the rose doesn't want to become a fish and the fish doesn't want to become a rose and they focus on what they have and they build it. Uh, but now we see roses uh, becoming fishes, fishes becoming roses. Uh, I mean, where is that heading? I, I, it sounds like some form of evolution. <laughs> 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 I don't know. I haven't seen too many roses in the ocean, but hey, it is possible. On, well, what an evolution, a rose smelling like fish, for God's sake. <laughs> uh, please no. <laughs> no perfume from that rose, thank you. Here, here's what I'll say uh, about branding and the future. I mean, ultimately, the, I have no idea where branding is going to go. What I do know is that I like brands that I can connect to emotionally. I like brands that matter to me, that 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 become useful in my life and make me feel good. It's ultimately that simple. And yeah, that needs a human message. And yeah, that can be a, that can be done via a community uh, oriented approach. And yes, you do need to experiment with a lot of different media that we have right now um, and, and, and try to communicate that. But ultimately, if it's not in you and normal and, and and core to you, it won't last. It won't stick. I mean, the, the, the NBA comes to mind, National Basketball Association, right? Where, what is it? Is it 80%, 90% of the players are black? And so Black Lives Matter is critical for the NBA, right? But guess what? Uh, you can use social media messages or social justice mess messages on your jersey or your equipment in the NBA now, but there's a small list of approved ones that you can use. And so what you have is you have some of the biggest stars opting out of using that because it's not authentic to who they are. So LeBron James says he won't use that, for instance, right? Well, you know what? If it's not real, if it's not core to you, it's not going to last. You're not going to have a consistent message over time. And uh, then it's just... Uh, flavor of the month and it's kind of your it's not brand anymore because brand is something that lasts right brand is like personality and and you may change and evolve much over your life but there's some core elements of your personality that probably follow you all throughout your life through the many decades that you have hopefully same with a brand a brand is something that is 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 a core part of, of who a company is. So you have a company like Tesla where the brand is, you know, it's about making the world a better place because there's less pollution. So you can have Elon Musk doing crazy, wild, stupid, odd things that he gets fined for, punished for, wrist slapped for, and other things like that from the SEC. Um, but the brand still remains, right? Uh, and I think that's absolutely critical for us to remember. Absolutely, John. I can't agree more than that. Thank you so much for sharing this. And uh, what is the future of branding, Anastasia? I totally agree with John. I think that behind every brand, uh, every brand and company, there are people. And when brand is communicating uh, with the users or customers, I think that those people should communicate because the message should be simple and very, very warm. Uh, because I really like the comparison of uh, brand and personality because the brand is so the heart of the company. I think that brands should go into a more simple way of communicating. Okay, yeah, you started. You started with the word simple and um, um, your, your message is clear. 
but simplifying the message in this complex times sounds like a great idea, but how easy it is to execute this? Because you see, I mean, uh, this I, mean, I could be a deep fake now. I mean, I'm not, <laughs> but I could be. Are you sure? <laughs> yes, I am, dude. I'm a hundred percent sure this time I am. Uh, even though Elon Musk you mentioned his name, he's not sure. He 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 says it's like what was the ratio? One one to eight hundred thousand is the probability that we are not a virtual reality simulation. So who knows? But um, at the end of the day, as much as we can be sure. So how do you make it simple in such a complex manner and in a complex world, Anastasia? Otherwise, it sounds great. But I'm currently I'm, I'm sure there are like thousands of of brand uh, experts who are with us online, and they say, yeah, how do I make it simple? So um, can you take it from there? Maybe, uh, and I'll, I'll be asking further uh, to, to have this uh, question answered by all of you, but Anastasia, let's, let's also say, okay, simple, simple communication. What do you expect from brands? I what think are your expectations first, today first and what would be you expect your expectations in the future? First of all, you expect uh, the brand talking honestly to you. I think that's the simplicity because uh, if you, as a brand, promise something and then you fail, uh, that's the biggest mistake. So it, your message is your commitment, and you should you should say and then do. That's that's the key thing for brands. Thank you so much, Anastasia. And um, uh, back to Roger. Roger, the future of, uh, I, we said it, it's a simple question, very short answer. The, sim uh, the, the future of branding. And I would like also to hear how do you expect the, uh, the, the, the brand expectations, sorry, the expectations to the brands will change. How to expect, what would be, what will be the trends uh, in, um, in, in the, expectations from from the brands from from the consumer point of view what do you think I'll look at this from two standpoints one i think uh, it's important that brands think about convenience uh being uh simplifying the customer's life to echo the simple uh word but in a different context uh, any brand that can simplify the customer's life and show through its messaging that it's doing that i think is going to have some success they're going to have a leg up over their competition so to me, that's one key thing to emphasize. And they're also, I write a lot about neuromarketing using uh, various kinds of techniques to uh, gauge what consumers really think. You know, obviously every problem can't be solved by using the tools of neuroscience or related biometrics and such. But I think that they do present an opportunity for brands to determine which messages truly resonate with consumers and their customers because you know so often these decisions are made in a conference room with a bunch of people and they uh, either vote or the highest paid person decides on this is what our message is going to be uh, without actual data to back that up and to me uh, using customer behavior data using your marketing data and going to evidence-based decisions uh, is going to serve brands really well well you said evidence-based decisions uh it will be great to have some facts, stats, examples, research. Um, I know you you put some some in in your books that we see. Uh, that I like the real backgrounds, honestly speaking. I know you don't take me seriously now because I have my virtual studio around me, but the real backgrounds are the real stuff. At least it's it's kind of authenticity where you can touch something and put it down on on your desk. So um, if we if we go for um, the, because we really have to wrap up. Can you give examples? And that's a question for all of you, and that should be the, 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 the wrap up of our discussion. Great examples of really success stories of how our current um, um, after or during COVID, DC, during COVID time, um, is working for, for brands who follow all these principles that we were discussing. And maybe that to be kind of a wrap up of all the discussion by four of you. 
um, like the final message that you would like to to be, you know, kind of the crown of, of what you just said. Anastasia, to start with you, please. Uh, I think I would mention the exact brands, but what I what I see and what I do like that some some of brands here in Russia, for example, uh, react really fast on these pandemic things. Uh, we had a lot of problems here with the restaurants and this kind of businesses in Moscow. And so th the brands who just reacted really fast, they started the deliveries, they delivered food to the doctors and so on, and they really survived. But those who decided not to do this, not to react fast, they just died. And that's, uh, that's the rule of this time. So if you react fast, if you do something, uh, if you participate in the life of other people, you win. That's the thing. Thank you so much, Anastasia. And uh, Rit? Yeah, I, I have to echo what she said. I, I, I don't know that I'm going to get into the particular brands, but I, I, I'll go back to something I said earlier in matching um, about positioning and matching audience more is more about matching purpose to actions. I think that you know somebody brought up Amazon earlier, and, and they're having their employee issues internally. Uh, you know, we live in a world where people know so much more about brands than they used to. They know what their CEO says. They know what their CEO does. They know what uh, what what's going on inside of companies. And and if and if you know what you're saying outwardly does not match what you're doing inwardly. Then, then I think you're going to have a, a long-term problem. So I think being intentional about your internal culture, uh, taking genuine and real uh, strides to work on your culture and improve your culture and make it a great place to be and work um, that has a, a great purpose um, along with a great product and, 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 and all of that. I think, uh, I think that's just really super important. And I think you know, we've all talked about how Today, the expectation is that companies take a stand, that you're not neutral, that you take a stance uh, on societal issues uh, and you do that quickly. But at the same time, I think that outward stance and that outward position really has to match the internal. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, your employees are going to call you out on it. And, and I think your customers will then call you out on it. So um, I think that's the key to, to, to branding. And I think it's the key to what customers and society is going to expect of companies and brands uh, in the future. Thank you so much, Ray. Absolutely. I can't agree more. Roger? Well, to go with the uh, evidence and database approach, you know, I think I'll, I'll single out Amazon, although as we just discussed, they did have a few problems. Uh, their decisions tend to be made by data. Their website looks the same, we would say, as it did 10 years ago, but actually there have been hundreds of tiny changes that most of us didn't notice, notice because they were evolutionary, not revolutionary. They didn't say, well, it's been a few years, let's do a new website. Instead, they test and test and test. And this is a tool that any size brand can use, you know, not just big brands, even small brands can run tests to see what actually works better. And uh, uh, then I think the other key point is, you know, a few weeks ago, I had management guru Tom Peters on my podcast, and he emphasized that your customers can never be happier than your employees. And, you know, to me, that is something that really needs to be internalized. You know, yeah. uh, your customers simply are never going to be happier than your own people are, and uh, focus on both groups. Thank you so much, Roger. Thank you so much indeed. It is... Um uh, such a complex world, but I will wrap up your words in maybe in uh, in like two sentences, and I think it will say it all. I'm so grateful to have you and sharing your thoughts and vision. And John, that's uh, you, um, the last of of, uh, of my panelists, of uh, uh, sharing your vision on uh, on the next in branding and. Uh, yeah, we've heard, some really interesting, we've heard some really interesting and good stuff today. I mean, I think in light of some of the past comments, there is no inside, there is no outside. There is just 
company, the brand and people and their information flows both ways. And, and so you've got to have the great communication and treatment inside as you do outside. In terms of um, brands in this time, I don't care so much what you say, I care what you do. And I wanna see what you do. And there's this small restaurant chain near where I live, near Vancouver, Canada, called Cactus Club. And immediately after COVID-19 and the shutdown, you could order online, you could pick up right at the curb, you could get delivery, a lot of other things. And so you couldn't go in and eat the way you could before, but there were multiple other ways to get as good of an experience as you could elsewhere uh, in, in, in a different way. I think that's really, really critical. So brands that invested in multiple ways of serving their customers are now able to reap the rewards. Thank you so much. What an amazing discussion. I love it. I wish this could go on and on and on because first, I have so many questions to ask. Second, I'm sure that all our community is, is like uh, 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 absolutely hungry for more of, of that information, but that's it. We have to stop here. And if I have to wrap up, of course, I'll be uh, most probably, I will, I will not say everything, but uh, I will start from, from backwards being fast. Um, and it, it obviously key in challenging, changing times like those um, proactively involve communities built around obviously necessities and, create simple, authentic communication so that you can really build your brand, uh, not like a standalone organism, but actually a full, fully integrated through your employees, through your customers, through your values, the real experience. So I think that's a wrap of a fantastic, um, virtual webinar on brand innovation as a whole week. I'm so grateful to, to my amazing uh, panelists and guests at Webit Virtual, and I am all so grateful about having you because whatever we talk about, it is all about community. And that's why we change the way we act at Webit. That's why we decided that once per year is no longer enough. So that's why we have three times per week, which means that uh, basically we have increased by a total of 1,000 fold <laughs> our meetings with all of you wonderful Webit community members from all around the world. 1,000 times, not bad for a start. Thank you so much for being with us. And I see you during next week with another Webit virtual event. Thank you. Thank you, Plavin. This program is powered by the virtual.show, making your offline events virtual.